Uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, ASEM's uh, seminar series. A uh, very special speaker today, Dr. Matthias Kiroz. Uh, we'll be talking about subsampling MCMC. Thanks, Matthias. Thank you for that introduction. So I will assume that everyone can hear me. And if you can, Scott's watching the chat over there, so he'll let us know of any, any technical issues we're facing. So uh, I'm a lecturer these days at UTS, but this is actually broadcasted from UNSW because most of the work uh, was done here at UNSW, or all of the work actually. Uh, and uh, we scheduled this, uh, this seminar series like one or two months ago when I still was, was with the UNSW. So this talks about uh, giving you an introductory overview of a series of papers on a topic that we call subsampling MCMC. Uh, and I list my collaborators here in alphabetical order. So most people here from UNSW, uh, everyone's affiliated with ASAMS. And I will present uh, three papers today. So the first one is a paper that we published in JASA. Uh, and that paper is an approximate approach uh, in the sense that uh, the algorithm that we developed there was generating samples from an approximate posterior. And then we did a follow-up paper, uh, the second one here, the block Poisson estimator, this, this title here. Uh, and that's an exact approach. So I put exact here in quotation marks because I want to explain later what I mean with exact. And last but not least, uh, a paper uh, that we published in, uh, that recently got accepted to the Journal of Machine Learning Research. And uh, that paper is about how we can extend these two approaches to, to tackle more interesting models, uh, more interesting meaning models with, with more parameters. And we also published a paper in Sanke A which is, um, I like that this paper, it's not as technical as the other papers. It's a textbook-like review of all of these three papers. So if there's one paper of these four that you need to read if you want to learn about this, I would actually suggest this one because it's, it's a very nice uh, introductory overview of these three papers. So this is a technical seminar, uh, but I'll make sure that uh, I don't do too technical stuff on it. So what, I've instead, uh, what I instead did was that I placed a few of the, of, uh, the technical stuff at, at the end of this, this presentation, which is also uploaded on my website, and I uploaded it to Twitter. So, and there's a lot of references during this whole talk. So if you want to access the references, uh, you can have the slides either here or here. Okay. So the motivation of this work is that uh, Mark of Chain Monte Carlo, despite what everyone's been saying lately about approximate approaches and so on, uh, it's actually been the Bayesian workhorse for, for three decades now. However, we are realizing more and more that MCMC is often very slow. Uh, and the reason for this is simply that it's a sampling algorithm. And every time we want to obtain a sample, we need to evaluate the likelihood function. We typically require many samples. Uh, especially if the Markov chain moves very slowly. We need a, no, a lot of samples to, to discover the posterior distribution we, we're exploring. So there's been recently, there's been a lot of advances in how you can generate Markov chains that explore parameter spaces more efficiently by not moving the Markov chain so slowly. Uh, however, these come at the cost that you typically need some gradient information and you need to repeatedly do, do gradient evaluations over and over again. So subsampling MCMC here, the idea is as easy as it gets. So instead of working with the whole, the true likelihood, which uses all the data, you take a subsample of your data. In each iteration, you take a new subsample of the data and you estimate your likelihood. Obviously, since you're only working on a subsample, you're gonna do stuff in a, in a quicker way. So it's a very simple idea. Uh, the solution turns out to, new, to be a little bit more complicated than, than the problem formulation. But the key idea of, of uh, 
the approach that we have is, uh, is what is called pseudo-marginal Metropolis Hastings. So for those of you who know Metropolis Hastings, so pseudo-marginal Metropolis Hastings is just Metropolis Hastings on an augmented space. So in this notation here, theta, you guys can see this on your screen, so yeah. So theta here is the model parameter, so the thing we're usually interested in. And u here is going to denote some auxiliary variables, and those auxiliary variables will be the random variables used to obtain the likelihood estimator. So pseudo-marginal MCMC, you use that when you cannot compute the likelihood explicitly. You need to estimate it. So if you do usual Metropolis Hastings, this is the thing that you target. This is the posterior distribution, just proportional to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. And as I said, we now go into the augmented space. So you just augment with the use. You replace your likelihood here by an estimated version. And then you have the prior here. So what you want to do is that you want to sample on this augmented space. So Metropolis Hastings on the augmented space just reads like this. You initialize your chain at some arbitrary point, and then you make some proposals. You propose from, you propose your parameter, you propose your use, and you obtain an unbiased likelihood estimate that I denote here p hat at the proposed point. And then you just evaluate your Metropolis Hastings ratio. So if you guys recognize the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, you would just see that this goes down to the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. It's equal to the Metropolis Hastings algorithm if you replace your p hat here with, with the true likelihood, p of y given theta. And then you decide to accept or reject with this probability alpha here. So there's a nice paper here by Andrea Roberts in the Annals of Statistics showing like the theoretical properties of this thing. And it turns out that actually if you just, if you do the sampling on the joint space, uh, and if you marginalize out the use, so you don't care about the use, you only consider the theta, you actually get draws from, from the posterior distribution, the, things that you're in, the thing that you're interested in. And this is actually true for any positive unbiased estimator. But of course, for implementation, uh, the variance is gonna be very important. So if you have a very large variance, it's gonna be very inefficient. And the reason it's gonna be very inefficient with a large variance is that so if you ignore this proposal ratio here for a while and just focus here, so what happens if you have a large variance is that it can be the case that you severely overestimate the likelihood value at the proposed point here just because you have a lot of variance. So this algorithm is, is uh, going to go there, right? Because if, this, if the um, numerator here is much larger than the denominator, then this is going to be 1, okay? And then, by the Metropolis-Hastings mechanism, the proposed one becomes the current in the next stage, and it's going to be very hard for you to get something uh, which gives you an acceptance probability that is not close to zero, because then at the next stage, this one's going to be very, very large, and this guy's going to be very, very small. Okay? So there's some work in the literature showing, like, how should you implement your, your pseudo-marginal. And the rule that people uh, give is that you should have uh, a variance of the log of the estimator that, that's around one. So in our case, this would just mean like, choose the subsample size so that the variance of your log of the estimator is around one. That's what it would mean. Uh, pseudo-marginal originally, is for not just subsampling problems, but also uh, intractable likelihood problems. So in that case, you can think of U as being, for example, the random numbers that you use when you estimate the random effect model. So in the random effect models, if you have an integral and you do the integration by Monte Carlo, you can think of the use there as, um, as um, the random numbers. In our case, we do subsampling. So the use, we can view them in two ways. One is that we can view them as observations indices. So which of the observations of the full data set do we take? And another view of them could be as binary indicators. So we can have one binary indicator for each point in the data set. If it's one, 
we include that in our sample. If it's zero, we don't include it in the sample. Okay, so in this JASA paper, uh, what we did was that we constructed an estimator for the log likelihood. So a little bit of notation here. So if we start over here, so this is just the log likelihood here. It's gonna be the sum. I have a data set that has n observations in it, and it's gonna be the sum of the log likelihood contribution for each of the observations. And the L hat here is gonna denote an estimator of this quantity here. This estimator is basically just taking a subset indicated by the use here, computing the log likelihood uh, contributions only for the observations in the sub in the subsample, and then we scale it up again with uh, with this factor here. So M again is the subsample size, N is the size of our whole data set. And the reason that we do this scaling is because when, if we do the scaling and if we compute the expected value of this estimator, it's gonna give us back the true log likelihood. So this is in fact uh, an unbiased estimator of this quantity here, okay? It turns out that if you do simple random sampling, it's actually an awful idea because what's gonna happen in practice is that the contribution to this sum here is gonna vary tremendously between which observations you're considering at. And it's very well known, if you've taken a course in service sampling or something, that if you have populations that vary a lot, simple random sampling is not gonna do it for you. So what we did in this paper is that we took the difference estimator from uh, the service sampling literature, and we applied it to in, in this MCMC settings. So what the difference estimator requires is basically a control variant. So we're gonna have an approximation here for each of the log likelihood contributions. And you can write down a similar thing like this, but it's a little bit more complicated here uh, in this way. So you see that now instead of scaling up these guys over here, we're gonna scale up the differences. And the thing is that if the differences, if QI, is a good approximation of this guy here, then the differences are gonna be small. In particular, they're not gonna be, uh, they're not gonna vary that much as a function of theta. So this estimator is much more efficient. And it still has the property, if we take the expected value, we get back the thing we're interested in. Uh, but remember that in the pseudo-marginal algorithm, we're not plugging in any log thing. We're actually plugging in the likelihood on the ordinary scale. So what we need to do is that we actually need to take the exponent of the estimator here. And since the exponent is a nonlinear function, so even if we're unbiased on the log scale, after applying the exponent, we're not going to be unbiased anymore. So in this paper, we propose a bias correction, but it turns out that the correction term itself cannot be evaluated. We need to estimate it. And because of this, what we actually get is not unbiased anymore. But we have some results in the paper, under some assumptions, of course, that if we run our algorithm with this, uh, let me call it approximately unbiased estimator, if such a word exists, uh, if we run it with an approximately unbiased estimator, uh, we're going to sample from something that is not the truth. It's, the, it's a perturbed posterior. However, the perturbed posterior has a total variation norm error that behaves like this. So N here is the population size and M is the subsample size. So if you, for example, consider an asymptotic situation in which you let the data set grow, and you take your subsample to grow with the data set, but not as fast, say square root of n, then the total error is gonna behave as order m to the power of minus two. So it's gonna, it's gonna decay very, very quickly. And you'll see, you'll see examples of that. So uh, another important thing we did in this paper is that it's now realized that it doesn't matter actually if the variance, so this is the, what appears in the Metropolis-Hastings ratio over here. So it's actually okay that the numerator 
and the denominator are very variable as long as the ratio is not so variable. So if we look at this on the log scale, it's okay for this guy to have a big variance, it's okay for this guy to have a big variance, but the, what we care about is that the difference has a small variance. Stats 101, what do you do if you want to reduce uh, the, the variance of this thing here? You make uh, these, this estimator and this estimator positively correlated, right? So how can we do that? Uh, there's a paper in uh, JRSSB by Deligianidis. Uh, it's not a subsampling paper. They're considering random effect models. So in random effect, this is basically like the random variates used to do the Monte Carlo integration. And what these guys did was that they introduced correlation among those random variates from iteration to iteration. And by changing these guys very, very slowly, you actually get that this guy and this guy are going to be correlated. So you can achieve that by correlating the underlying random numbers. What we did in this paper here, in the JASA paper, was that in the subsampling context, what we have is our use, we can view them, as you remember, as I said, as binary indicators. So what you want to do is that you want to correlate binary sub subsampling indicators. And we did it through a Gaussian coppola in the paper. So I'll show some results from, for, for, from that paper now. So in that paper, we compared to some, some popular approaches in the machine learning literature. So there's two things we want to consider here. One is, are we accurate? Because all these things that I'm going to show you here are approximate. So do we accurately represent some ground truth? The second thing is that, are we doing it in a fast way? And the third thing is that, obviously, it's, it's more computationally cheap to run things on a subsample, right? It's obvious because you use less computations when, when you do this stuff. But what's going to happen is that uh, there's no free lunch, right? So what's going to happen is that it's going to be faster, but the mark of chain that you obtain is actually going to have a slower mixture. So whenever I'm comparing any, any measures that I'll show you today is balancing these two concerns. On the one hand, it takes into account how expensive it is to compute the likelihood or the likelihood estimator. And on the other hand, it's also taking into account how efficient is the Markov chain that, that, that we have. So the accuracy here, this is a very simple AR1, so not a regressive model with one lag. So let me just show you the left-hand side here first. This is our method. So the black one in both these figures here is the ground truth. It's MCMC. So this guy's not doing any subsampling, it's just using all the data. Uh, the blue one here and the yellow one uh, are our methods. So the first one is when we do not do the correlation, so we don't care about positively correlating these two guys. And the second one is that we care about positively correlating them. So what you can see from this figure is that no matter what we do, seems to be very accurate. Okay? Uh, the next one is showing the things we're comparing against. So again, the black one is, uh, is the truth. So the blue one and yellow one here is, are the papers by, by Bordenay and co-authors. And they're doing pretty good, right? It's, it's not bad. Uh, and the other ones here are, this is the Austerity Metropolis Hastings, the Koratikari paper. You see that it's, it's not doing that great. Uh, and then you have the Firefly Monte Carlo algorithm, which is certainly doing better, but it still, it still misses a lot here. Uh, and this number here tells you how much more efficient are we, or, or any method, compared to MCMC. Again, taking into account both the computational cost and the, how fast the chain is mixing. So, for example, if this number here means 10, so this is our method when we don't do the correlation, 
were a factor 10 faster than the whole, uh, than comparing to full MCMC. And you see that if we do the correlation, it's a game changer. So we go from 10 up to 50. So the correlation is very important. And this is the Bardenia paper. It's doing about five times faster. Uh, and then when you see numbers here below one, that means that because all these methods are certainly more cheap to compute because they use a subsample, but they are generating an integrated autocorrelation time, so the chain is mixing very slowly. So when you compare these two, if you're on the one, this means that you could, you're better off just taking the whole data set and not doing any subsampling. Okay, that's the approximate approach. So as I said, uh, this paper here uh, was approximate and it had a total variation norm error uh, behaving like this. The follow-up paper said, okay, so suppose that we want to do stuff in an exact way. How can, how can we, is it possible for us to do that? So this paper proposes a way to do something that's exact. Again, quotation marks, because I want to explain what I mean with exact. Uh, by using the block Poisson estimator. So the block Poisson estimator is uh, a product of Poisson estimators. So lambda here is an integer that's bigger than or equal to one. This guy here is a scalar. These guys here are the log likelihood estimators. Remember, we want to estimate the likelihood directly now. Not the, we want to we use the log likelihood estimators in order to estimate the full likelihood. So these guys are the same as the ones in the, in the paper we published in JASA. But we're not going to get, we're now going to uh, put them into this construction here. So this is a random product. So the chi L here are Poisson with expected value one. And we just define if chi L is zero, uh, we define the product to be one. So again, this guy is a log likelihood estimator. And the big L hat here is a likelihood estimator. So just to save some notation, you, you, before, when I was talking about likelihood estimators, I was using this symbol. Now I'll be using this symbol. So it's a quite complicated expression here, but I what I want you to notice is that on average, what this guy is requiring is lambda multiplied by m evaluations. So this product here, on average, it contains one term because they're Poisson one, and we have land of them. And every time we compute one of these, we use M, a subset of M, okay? So again, writing up the estimator, the form of the estimator, some properties, it's unbiased for the true likelihood. Remember, the other guy was never unbiased. This one is unbiased. It's almost surely positive, uh, only if this thing here minus this thing here is positive, uh, almost surely positive. If we fix lambda, then the variance of this estimator is minimized for this choice of A. So I'm now going to call A here a lower bound of this thing here, or sort of a lower bound. So if A is a lower bound, then it's clear from this expression here that everything's just positive, right? Like no matter what happens here, I'm gonna get something that's uh, with probability one uh, positive. However, uh, what we claim in this paper is that forcing A to be a lower bound is, is not the best thing to do. So. First of all, to know the lower bound, we actually need to know the log likelihood contributions for all the data points. And in that case, there's no point in subsampling anymore. But the second point is even more important. So even if you told me that, I'll give you the lower bound for free. So even if I don't need to evaluate uh, all the log likelihood contributions, I'm not so sure that I want to take that one because 
if it's a lower bound, then this guy here will be a large negative number. So if you just pretend that L is not here anymore. So if this guy is a large negative number, it means that lambda, because this is the, remember that this condition is the one that gives us the minimum variance. So if this guy is a large negative number, it means that lambda is a large positive number. And remember that lambda is the number of product in our estimator. So it's gonna be very, it's gonna be a computationally very costly estimator to, to, to choose. And therefore in this uh, paper, we introduced the concept of a soft low, lower bound. So a soft lower bound is that, so this guy is often bigger than A, but not always. So we're gonna have that the probability of this one is gonna be bigger than, than A, it's gonna be close to one. Uh, it's gonna give us a much more efficient estimator However, it can sometimes be negative. There's actually a framework by Line and co-authors that actually we have termed their method signed PMMH. Um, we hope they like the name. If any one of the authors here is listening in and uh, if you like the name, just send me an email and tell us that. But what the... <laughs> Yeah, we should, we, should, we should give Robert a microphone so you can hear his jokes. <laughs> um, so, so what these guys are doing, basically, is that they have this estimator that can, be, can sometimes be uh, negative. To fix that, they just plug an absolute value here. And then they keep tracks of uh, the number of times or which iterates had a negative value. So they record a sign, and then they introduce this important sampling type of estimator, which is just like, it's important sampling, but it's like waiting for, for the number of negatives that you, get, that you have. And this is actually a simulation consistent estimator. So if you let the number of MCMC threads go to infinity, you, can, uh, you will converge to this guy here, and this guy, notice that this guy is an expectation with respect to the true posterior distribution. There's no approximation here. This is the true posterior distribution. So you can compute to any desired accuracy, any expectation of a function uh, with this approach. Oh, sorry. So our contribution uh, to, to this method that these guys came up with is that in this paper, they don't, they don't give any guidelines. They're considering very complicated estimators that are called Russian roulette estimators. And they don't give any guidelines on how do you tune the parameters in, in those estimators because those estimators are like very hard. The block Poisson estimator under some assumptions becomes more computationally tractable. So we can actually give optimal, we can give uh, guidelines for optimal tuning of the parameters of our estimator. And what we also do is that we increase the efficiency of their method uh, by a concept that we call blocking, that I'll shortly explain. So just a few words about the optimal tuning. So in regular PMMH, so when you just have a positive unbiased estimator, there's been work on how you choose the optimal subsample size. So this work typically considers some function that you want to minimize. In this case, it's called the computational time. It's a function of the number of particles, or in our case, the subsample size. And it's proportional to, and this thing here makes a little bit sense. So you see that you multiply. So if you have a bigger subsample, this guy gets bigger. And then you have the integrated autocorrelation time. So this is just a measure of how efficiently your Markov chain is mixing. And it's a function of the variance. So if the variance is low, uh, your chain is going to mix very well. And if the variance is high, your chain is not going to mix so well. And this computational time is going to increase. So there's been some work finding out like, OK, so how should we choose this M? So 
Uh, these three papers here, they all agree that, okay, so you should implement your PMMH such that the variance of the log of the likelihood estimator is around one, okay? So choose them to achieve this target. <clears throat> However, uh, when you have a positively negative estimator, uh, you have to reconsider a little bit on how you define these things because now it's, it's not as straightforward as this. So in our paper, we define another computational time. So now it's going to be a function of the number of, uh, of the subsample size in the log likelihood estimator, but it's also going to be a, fu a function of the number of uh, products that you have in your estimator. So this one makes sense because this one is just um, the cost of computing the estimator. Uh, and then we have the integrated autocorrelation time, same as here. So you see that the difference from here to here is that there's an absolute value here because we can now become uh, negative. And the function, this variance here is a function of lambda and m. And then you have something that you don't have here. And this guy here penalizes for uh, the fact that you can get negative estimates. So tau here is the probability of the estimator being positive. And remember, it's not one anymore because we have the soft lower bound thing going on. So what the optimal lambda and m, they balance the cost of computing, as I said, the inefficiency of the chain you're generating, which in turn depends on the variance of the log of the estimator, and it's also balancing the probability of a positive sign. And in this paper, we also show that uh, this exact approach comes with, uh, it's exact, but it also has a higher computational uh, time than, than the approximate approach that, that, that we published in, in the other paper, which is expected because, you know, the exactness will come at a cost. Uh, let me move to the concept of blocking. So, sign PMMH, how can we increase the efficiency of that? So, the reason that we have this block form, I just presented it, I never showed you, like, why didn't we just choose one block? Uh, and the reason for doing the, the block form is that we can use block pseudo marginal. So, remember now that if we have an estimator with lambda blocks, so each of the blocks have random numbers. You can think of it as a subsample to estimate each of the blocks. So if you recall that what we wanted to do was to reduce the variance of this ratio here. Now these guys propose one way to do it, but there's another way to reduce to make these guys positively correlated. And that is this blocking idea. So if we change the random numbers, that is that we only pick new subsamples for a subset of, of the blocks, say capital G of them, and then we update these U's jointly with theta in each uh, metropolis hastings situation, we can show that we can achieve by doing this under certain assumptions, of course, uh, we can show that the correlation that we obtain is 1 minus g divided by lambda. So, for example, if I change 1% of, of them, I can achieve a correlation of 0 0.99. And that's going to reduce the variance of the ratio a lot. So you're going to get something that's much more efficient. And since it's... Uh, more efficient, so more efficient means that you can actually tolerate a bigger, the consequence is that you can tolerate a bigger variance of each of these guys. So a bigger variance usually translates into, it's computationally faster to compute. So by doing this, you don't need to choose the, the subsample size that, that large. You will still obtain good mixing in, in the things that you, that you sample. Okay, showing you the accuracy of this approach. So here I have a logistic regression with three data sets. So each column is a data set. We're estimating the expectation here. So uh, 
we're comparing against the ground truth, which is MCMC. If the points are among the 45 degree line here, which is marked in red, it means that our method is accurate. So you see that it's accurate here, and you see here what's going on here. But if you look at the scale of these axes here, you'll see that this is just Monte Carlo error. So we've done a lot of experiments showing that this is a very accurate method in infinite uh, samples, infinite MCMC samples. <clears throat> uh, quickly, just showing you some, some numbers compared to some speed ups. So if we compare to MCMC, for the first data set, we get about MCMC is the ground truth using all data, get about 100 to 100 something. Um, here it's about a thousand times faster. Is about a hundred times faster and these are just the uh, relative computing time so whenever this number is bigger than one means that we're doing faster than whatever we're considering uh, comparing against so for example if we look at the compare our stuff to Firefly Monte Carlo for this data set for example you find that we are between what's this 4,000 and maybe 25,000 times faster than, than that method Okay, so forget about subsampling for a while, uh, and uh, I'll deliver a short crash course here in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo before telling you how we can do subsampling for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is basically an efficient metropolisations proposal uh, that can do two things. It can move theta far, and it still man maintains a high acceptance probability. So the trick in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is that you basically just augment the space again with some momentum vector, the P vec here, and you consider uh, the Hamiltonian here on the joint space, which is minus log of the, the truth here that we want to sample, and then we add some, some structure for this, uh, for this momentum vector here. And then there's some dynamics describing how uh, the theta and the p here, p vec, moves through times. And these are the Hamiltonian equations. So for each parameter, you have this partial differential equation. And some nice properties about the Hamiltonian is that these uh, partial differential equations, when you solve them, they will define a mapping. If you start at some point, they will tell you how to map to another point, and the mapping is one-to-one. -one. So it means that the inverse exists. The second uh, nice property is the energy conservation, which just means that if you move uh, theta and p according to the dynamics, you're going to move along trajectories where this Hamiltonian stays constant. Okay, so there's the derivative with respect to t doesn't change. Uh, and it's also volume preserving. So the mapping that I was talking about, if you map a region, it preserves the volume. Uh, of, the, of, the, of the system. So the idea of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is basically just use the Hamiltonian dynamics to construct the uh, proposals for the metropolis tasting sampling. So we sample on the augmented space, we ignore the momentum vector, and we're going to sample from this guy here. So very short here, uh, the algorithm for doing so would just be, this is just metropolis tasting. So we use just as before, it was Metropolis Hastings for the pseudo marginal, but now it's with the Hamiltonian. So we use the Hamiltonian dynamics with some integration time to obtain the proposal, and then we compute the acceptance probability here. And then we have the, accept, the usual accept reject step of the Metropolis Hastings. So, two things I want you to notice there's no proposal ratio here. The reason for that is that uh, it disappears due to the reversibility. Of, of the Hamiltonian and its dynamics. Uh, there is no need to account for any changes in the volume here because of the volume preservation. And the third and most important one is that it conserves energy. So it means that if I move along uh, according to the Hamiltonian dynamics, then the, the energy at this point is going to be the same as the energy at this point. So this number is going to be the same as this number which means that we're going to have, always going to have an acceptance probability of one. So 
if we integrate the system for a long time enough, uh, we can make distant moves because we integrate it for a long time and we can achieve an acceptance probability of one. That's why Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is so efficient. Sounds great. However, in practice, uh, there's um, a few obstacles. The first one is that we cannot solve the Hamiltonian dynamics uh, explicitly except for toy models, maybe a toy model even. Uh, the second one is, of course, it's no free lunch. It comes at more computational, with more computations because the Hamiltonian dynamics uh, involves, simulating the dynamics involves evaluating the gradient of the posterior. If we have a large uh, number of observations, this, uh, this gradient here is expressed as this, and we see that the gradient contributions, if n is very large, this is going to be very costly to compute. Uh, the first step is uh, solved uh, by physicists, I think. And it's using symplectic integrators. So these are just numerical integrators that conserve the energy approximately. So it's not exactly one, but it's close to one. And they also maintain these all the nice uh, the properties of the reversibility and the volume uh, the, um, preservation. And our contribution is to uh, give a solution to these two ones. So that we actually, it's very costly and we try to, to speed up. So there's a paper by Meta Michael Betancourt uh, showing that naive subsampling does not conserve energy. So naive subsampling is just, okay, so let's look at this guy, let's make an, uh, an unbiased estimator of the gradient, let's go for it and see what happens. So Michael Betancourt shows that when you do this, the acceptance probability drops to zero quickly as the dimension increases. Uh, there's another paper by Chen and co-authors who realizes that this is gonna happen. So what they instead do, instead of looking at the usual Hamiltonian dynamics, they are modifying the uh, dynamics in order to, to account for, for this problem. And because in their framework, adding an accept reject step will uh, result in that they need to compute for the whole data set, uh, they skip adding an accept reject step. So they're simulating the dynamics, but they're not doing any accept reject decision. And this means that uh, the dynamics needs to be simulated uh, in a very accurate way. So what, what's gonna happen here is that the step size uh, needs to be small because the, the bias that they have will be a function of the step size that they're using. So our contribution in this paper is that, okay, so we realize that what Michael Betancourt says is true, and we ask ourselves, and, and the reason that what Michael Betancourt says is true is because when you estimate the dynamics, you're not conserving the energy of the Hamiltonian, of the correct Hamiltonian. We ask ourselves, can we do subsampling in such a way that we can conserve the energy? That's what, what our paper's about. Okay, again, U are the observations indices. So we have M of them to sample. And what we do in this paper here is that we just, we consider another Hamiltonian here. I put a hat on it. So this is like the other Hamiltonian, but there's some estimate here. So this guy is an estimator of the true likelihood. And now, instead of just considering this space here as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, we further augment with variables use, which are the observation indices, and we're gonna sample something that's proportional to this. We use the L hat either from, from the exact paper or from the approximate paper, and for both L hats, we can derive the gradient with respect to theta. So turns out that if we do this stuff, yeah, so, so now, now the question is how to sample this. The paper, we have uh, the approach of using Metropolis Hastings within Gibbs. 
So if we're given a subsample, we just do a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo step with this energy. Notice the hat here, which is going to be computed from the subsample that we're given. And once we update the parameter vector and the momentum vector, we're going to update the use here uh, using a block pseudo marginal step. And we can show that uh, when we do, we sample this. If we marginalize out the, the p vec here and the u, if we use the estimator in, in the approximate paper here, we're going to get the perturb posterior. We're going to get the same perturb posterior. And there's already theory in this paper for that this perturb posterior behaves like this. So let me just tell you that Hamilton and Monte Carlo is a game changer. So it allowed us to go from four and a half million data points with only nine parameters to the same four and a half million data points, but we could also now consider an additive spline logistic regression model with 81 parameters. And I'm going to show you some results against uh, some, some approaches here in the, in the literature. So, so it's a lot of numbers here, but I've just marked the ones that you really need to care about. The reason I put everything here is because the slides are available. So if you want to have a look at the in detail, you can do that. So this is our method here, the blue one, uh, sorry, the red one. Uh, this is HMC. So HMC is just Hamilton and Monte Carlo using all the data. So first of all, you see, if we use all the data, there's a huge number of evaluations we need to do. Evaluations here are both the likelihood evaluations and the gradient evaluations. This is a lot of evaluations we need to do. The integrated autocorrelation time tells you how fast the chain is mixing. So one is the best you can do. So if you do Hamilton and Monte Carlo two, that's pretty good as well. And this numbers around 7K here means that our method, this is 7K times slower than our method. Okay, so when you balance this, the, the efficiency of the chain and the number of valuations, you get something that's seven times slower when you do the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, okay? Compared to our method. So this is the, the stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the CHAMP paper I was telling you about. So if you notice the first implementation here, so we can achieve an, an inefficiency here that's similar to what we have in our method. But if you look at the cost here, it's about a factor 10 times more costly to achieve the same efficiency. Hence, 10 times slower. If you instead make sure to have an estimator for this, uh, for, for their method, it's the same method, but you make sure to have an estimator that has around the same number of uh, evaluations as our method, so they're equally fast, you get that the integrated autocorrelation time blows up. And you see here that the final method here, the stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics, it's the fastest one in terms of pure evaluations. It's very, very fast. But in terms of the integrated autocorrelation time, uh, it's, it's uh, not doing as good as the other methods. So what about the accuracy? So the first one, so the green is the truth. The red one is the, in the first one here, the red one is our method. So this is just four randomly chosen parameters. You see that our method is uh, recovering the, the truth, which at least close to it. The stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method, if you do the first implementation, when you make sure that the integrated autocorrelation times are around the same, it's also accurate. But remember that obtaining this approximation here is 10 times slower from a computational point of view. Okay? If you instead make them as fast as our method is, so we saw here that they are about as fast, but then the integrated autocorrelation time goes up. So if you do that, and then you plot your posteriors, this is what you're going to end up with. So it's not going to be uh, an accurate uh, representation of the, true, of the green line here. And finally, this method that's super fast, it's, only, it's the fastest of them. So it's only using this number of evaluations, but the integrated autocorrelation time is, is big. So if you, if you use that to make your inferences, 
to remember that green lines the truth, red one here is, is what that method is giving you. Okay, uh, let me conclude this talk. I've overviewed three papers on subsampling MCMC, how, you, how that can help you when you have a large data set. Presented one approximate approach, targeted a perturbed posterior, but we had uh, some theory showing that the error quickly goes to zero, showed you an alternative approach that could, can give you consistent estimates of uh, expectations with respect to the true posterior density, so there's no approximation going on there. We extended both approaches uh, to tackle high di higher dimensional problems by uh, introducing a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that actually conserves energy. Uh, we showed that we have some very favorable results compared to other approaches in the literature. Some work I haven't covered here is applying these ideas to sequential Monte Carlo. Uh, and also applying these ideas in, in uh, something that's called the delayed acceptance uh, MCMC. So, thank you so much. Questions? I have actually five slides of extra material regarding the optimal tuning, if you want to see that. And there's six slides of references as well. So, this is the extra material. Yeah, and the reference, the reference list is quite long. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Matthias, for a great talk. Um, so we're taking questions now. Okay, so uh, Aline asks, does this work for multimodal or non-Gaussian posteriors? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the thing is that everything goes down to having a good control variant. So we have some ongoing work on how to improve our control variants for more complicated models. So everything's about this, like this. We have a control variant for each observation. And if you have multimodal things going on, this guy's going to be multimodal. And in the paper, I haven't said it here, but in the in both papers, we have a quadratic approximation. So with that control variant, no, it's not going to work. However, we can certainly do better than a quadratic control variant, and then I believe it can work. Good question. <laughs>